Hi, uh, good morning. This QR code here will take you to these slides. Uh, don't worry, it will be repeated at the end of the presentation. So if you want to see the slides, you can snap that uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so that's my outline for this morning. Uh, some introductions, then a quick description like on the theoretical aspects, like the anatomy of a Kubernetes cluster. Then we will build a one node cluster, uh, see how to connect to services running on that cluster, and see how to add more nodes. And then I will try to give a really short description of what's missing between that, that cluster and a real production cluster. So first, uh, I'm Jerome Petazzoni. Uh, I'm French, as you probably guessed from my accent, uh, but I live in the US and I also sometimes uh, spend time in Germany. Deswegen spricht ich auch ein bisschen Deutsch. Uh, I am a container hipster. I was running containers in production before it was cool. I worked seven years at a small container startup uh, called Docker. Uh, and in the last couple of years of that period of time, I also struggled with burnout and depression. So I have a few links in these slides like about that, if it's another topic that you would like to, to, to know about. Um, and since leaving Docker, I took some time off and then I, now I'm doing training uh, about containers, about Kubernetes, about all these things related. Uh, and I like emojis, as you probably guessed, but don't worry, that will be the only slide uh, that will be emoji heavy. For the rest of the presentation, I'm going to use normal slides in plain English. So the, why is this, this talk? Uh, last year, I decided that I wanted to pass an exam, the CKA exam, like Certified Kubernetes Administrator, and I was uh, scared because I hadn't passed an exam in a really long time, and I was uh, kind of worried about, am I going to be able to do this? Because I knew how to set up clusters the easy way with QBDM, I knew how to use Kubernetes. I had, like, I, I was training people on, on Kubernetes already, and um, I had given a bunch of presentations uh, about like container internals. But uh, truth is, I had no idea how Kubernetes really works. Uh, I had never deployed Kubernetes the hard way, following uh, Kelsey Hightower's excellent GitHub repo. Uh, so I felt very unprepared for that exam. So I wanted to learn uh, enough about Kubernetes so that I could pass that exam. Uh, and I also wanted to feel comfortable teaching that to other people. However, uh, I didn't care about setting up a production cluster from scratch. And when I say from scratch, uh, I don't mean from source. I, in that case, I'm just using uh, release binaries from Kubernetes, Docker, whatever. Um, just for a quick show of hands, who is here because they uh, have to build Kubernetes clusters themselves? A few hands, I'm so sorry. <laughs> who is here just because they are curious about Kubernetes internals? I'm so, so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> who is here because my speaker bio said that I could play the Zelda theme on any music instrument and they're curious about that? <laughs> oh, no, 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 you don't want that, no. <laughs> Okay, if you have other reasons, I would be curious about them at the end if you can tell me because I, I like to know why people come to my talks. All right, so the really short version uh, after doing a lot of research uh, is that the easiest way to run Kubernetes is to get somebody else to do it for you, trust me. Um, so <laughs> that being said, uh, that I'm, if basically like at some point in this presentation you decide that um, this is not for you and you want to walk out, I will just conclude that you internalize that conclusion and I will not take it personally. <laughs> Uh, and also, when I submitted that proposal, I submitted it both as a talk and a tutorial, and both were accepted to my uh, greatest dismay, uh, which means that if you want something hands-on um, Wednesday, there will be the long version where we'll be doing basically the same thing, except I will give everyone a cluster so they can run the same demos as the, the demos I will run now. So that's going to be Wednesday at 11. All right, so now a little bit of theory, like Kubernetes anatomy, the whole truth about Kubernetes is that it feels like an imperative system at first because we do kubectl run this, kubectl deploy that, kubectl expose my containers, etc., etc. But under the hood, it really is uh, a declarative system. 
each time we do kubectl run, create, expose, etc., we really generate a manifest, a description of what we want to have. That manifest will be saved uh, into each CD by the API server, and then there will be a bunch of controllers, a, a bunch of loops that will react to that and make things happen. So I can't really say run a container. I can say this is the specification of a container that I would like you to run, and then eventually, hopefully, uh, that container will run. This is, um, from my perspective, one of the best uh, diagrams to understand the general architecture of Kubernetes. As you can see, everything is talking to the API server in the middle. In fact, when we interact with Kubernetes, all that, all that we're doing is uh, writing a bunch of objects into each CD. Except each CD is a key value store uh, without, you know, like schemas, tables, columns, types, etc. So instead of letting us just like dump a bunch of things into each CD, uh, every access to each CD is gated through the API server. So that's what we do each time we use Kubernetes command like kubectl, uh, etc. We are just read and writing structured data that is in each CD. Uh, and then we have uh, our nodes on the bottom. We can see that the nodes are connecting to that API server as well through that little kubelet agent. So on each node, we have kubelet, which is basically uh, connecting to the API server to say, oh, hey there, I'm node number 52. Uh, do you have uh, any work that I should be doing? And then the control plane is essentially going to reply, sure, welcome to the cluster. I would like you to start this and this and this uh, pod, this and this and this container, please. And then kubelet is going to work on that and continuously report back to the control plane about the status and health of uh, of these containers. So that's the, the big picture. Um, speaking of pictures, uh, there is a thing about one picture being worth 1,000 words. So I brought like 19 pictures, which is probably like 19,000 words. So this is what really happens uh, when we do kubectl run web. So that's the name of the deployment I want to create. Uh, image Nginx with three replicas. So this is my cluster with in the middle my control plane. Uh, we can see that big cylinder, which is the universally accepted symbol for storage. Uh, on the right, I have a couple of nodes, and all the gray arrows indicate like possible communication, and they will light up in red when things happen. So I get myself some DevOps. Uh, I've put humans, but also robots, uh, just because this could be scripts actually like communicating with my cluster. And so my DevOps are going to deploy some containers, as one does. Um, so they connect to the API server and basically they say create a deployment according to that specification. The API server is going to write that spec to its CD uh, and then it's going to say, I got it. Uh, and at that point we can disconnect from the API server knowing that stuff's going to happen behind the scenes. But it's a little bit like when we place an order at a restaurant, like the, uh, the, the waiter like the, the goes away and the kitchen is working on it, um, but we haven't the, the food yet. So how, what, what happens in the kitchen? Where, so the controller manager has a bunch of loops, each responsible for a specific type of object in each CD. And so there is the controller for deployments that wakes up and is like, oh, we have a new deployment. We should do something about it. Let's create a replica set. A replica set will be a bunch of identical pods. And so it's just going to create that object, go back to sleep. And then there is the controller responsible for replica sets that's going to wake up. You're like, oh, you want three Nginx pods? All right, I'm going to create three Nginx pods. At this point, when I say create pods, I don't mean actually run the containers, but just create the pods uh, in the etcd database. So now I have three pods and they are pending, which means they are kind of queuing outside the cluster, waiting to know like where they should run. And then uh, the replica set controller goes back to sleep. Then the scheduler, uh, which I like to think like a grandmaster of Tetris is going to wake up and notice, oh, we have pending pods, so we, sh we should assign them to nodes. So it's going to say, all right, you go to node one, node two, node one. And then it goes back to sleep. 
at that point, the kubelets, which were asking, hey, do you have something that I should be running, are going to notice, oh yes, um, node one should have two pods, node two should have one pod. So they are going to tell to the API server, I'm working on it. So the containers will show up as creating, and then kubelet is going to do a bunch of network things, pulling images, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, they will report back to say the pods are running. And then at this point, we are done. We haven't really talked about network, etc. but this is to give you the, the, the big picture or rather the 19 big pictures of what happens uh, when we create a deployment on Kubernetes. So now I'm going to um, create a one node cluster and we're going to try to see these things um, in action. So, uh, what do we need for this? I'm going to use it's a Linux machine. Uh, I need root because I'm going to run a bunch of things that need root access. On, on this machine, uh, I will have the binaries for everything, like I installed etcd, the Kubernetes binaries, the Docker binaries, uh, but nothing is running yet. Uh, so what I will do is that I will create a deployment and basically I'm going to hammer on my cluster until I get it to work. Um, so the, the commands, the exact commands that I will be running are not in this slide deck, uh, but they will be in the other slide deck that I will use for the tutorial on Wednesday. Uh, so this is my demo slide. I wish I could remember which uh, image query I made because in the middle that's Kelsey Hightower about to do some live demo and I, I haven't managed to find which string I used to get that. I just took a screenshot and I was like, okay, I'm gonna use that. Anyway, um, so uh, I'm going to log into uh, a, a machine that has, as I was saying, like nothing is running. Uh, you can see like a, it's a brand new machine. Well, I mean, that's just kernel stuff, right? <laughs> um, and I'm going to get root because uh, I don't want to be bothered about security yet. So let's do things like, a, I know, I know. Then I'm going to use Tmux um, as my process uh, manager. And so my, my uh, goal is to be able to do kubectl create deployment web dash dash image nginx. So when I do that, it's telling me, hey, I can't connect to the API server. Uh, yeah, the API server is not running. So this, uh, this is not expected to work. So I try to start the kube API server. And uh, if I scroll back in these pages and pages and pages of help, at the very beginning, uh, it's nice enough to tell me, hey, you need to give me the list of, yes, the, whoops, dash dash etcd servers must be specified. Yeah, the API server can't work without etcd. So let's start with etcd. So I try to start etcd, and then I'm lucky because etcd doesn't need any other parameter. Uh, at this point, it's up and running. I have etcd running on my machine. Great. So now I can start the API server uh, with dash dash etcd servers, and I need to pass the URL to my etcd server, uh, 2379, that's the default port for etcd. So I do that, I get a few pages of messages, um, and uh, that seems a little bit scary. What's wrong? It's 2379, 2379, 2379, that should be it. Uh, oh, I put HTTPS instead of HTTP. Yeah, good, good habits, you know. <laughs> Of course, I totally intended to do that. Um, so HTTP, okay, now we get a bunch of pages of messages and at the beginning we don't really know if it works or not, but um, let's, let's give it a shot again. kubectl create deployment, web dash dash image nginx, and it's telling me deployment created. That was easier than we thought maybe, uh, except if I take a look at the resources on my cluster, uh, I see that I have a deployment, but I don't have yet the replica set, uh, let alone the pods. Um, so I kind of think, all right, what is supposed to create the replica set? Oh, that's the controller for the deployment. So I need to start uh, the controller manager. 
And the controller manager is, of course, going to tell me, hey, how am I supposed to contact like your API server again? Like, all right, dash dash master, uh, localhost, 8080. So now the controller manager is going to start. And almost immediately, I can see that I do have a replica set. Uh, but I still don't have a pod. And if I look at the output of the controller manager, it's going to tell me something about a service account token. So after doing a little bit of research, uh, we learn that uh, we have something called service accounts uh, so that the processes running in pods on Kubernetes can connect to the Kube API. And normally, uh, there should be something uh, generating a service account token and signing it with the key, etc. And we haven't set up that thing yet. Uh, so there are many ways to work around that issue. Um, Ottoman service account token. Yeah, that's that's one of these ways. Like basically, tell it, don't try to use that 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 token yet. It's fine. And when I do that now in the in the output, uh, there is something that says, all right, I was able to create the pod. Uh, so now I have my deployment. I have the replica set. I have the pod, but it is pending. It is pending because we're waiting for the scheduler, which is not running, to assign the pod to a node, which I don't have. Uh, so I'm going to try to, you know, like start uh, the, let's say, the scheduler, uh, cube scheduler. Same thing, it's going to tell me, hey, where is the API server? I'm like, all right, fine. That's going to be localhost 8080. So now I have a scheduler, but the scheduler doesn't have any node. It's telling me like no nodes available to schedule pods. So I need to get myself a node. So for that, I'm going to use kubelet and tell kubelet to connect to my API server. Here, uh, be not really dragons, but like uh, uh, that, that thing got me stumped for a moment. Uh, when you start kubelet like this, First, it's like, hey, I'm, I need a container engine. Kubelet is not going to run the containers directly. It's going to uh, rely on Docker or Cryo or ContainerD or Rocket or etc. So we need a container engine. Well, I worked seven years at Docker and one of the things I remember is that I can start the Docker engine with just Docker D like this. That was easy. So now I can start Kubelet again. And that's the tricky part. It, like, it looks like it works, uh, but it doesn't. Or rather, it is now in standalone mode. We could use Kubelet as a standalone uh, process manager, a little bit like a super systemd, if you will, um, and give it like a bunch of YAML files with pod manifests. Um, but what we really need to do is to tell it, hey, I want you to connect to that API server. Uh, so for that, unfortunately, we can't just uh, pass like a, a URL like this, uh, we need to pass a cube config file. That cube config file will have the same format as the cube config file that we might use as uh, end users of, uh, of Kubernetes. So it, it needs to have like the URL of the API server, the credentials that we want to use. Uh, so we have a couple of options here. We can write some YAML from scratch. Nope. Uh, or I can use some helpers. So for instance, kubectl config. Um, okay, just you can see that in dot cube, uh, right now I, I just have this, right? And so when I do kubectl config yada yada, it's going to create the kube config file in there. Uh, so I need to do a set cluster, uh, dash dash server, http localhost. Uh, whoops, uh, right, I need to give a name. So let's say localhost. Uh, then I need to do a set context. A context will be a combination of uh, a cluster, like a, so the API endpoint to use, and some credentials, and a namespace. Here it's a little bit redundant. We just need to define a context that refers to the cluster. And then I need to use that context uh, which means mark it as the default context to use in the in the cube config file. Now in this directory, I see that there is a brand new config file, uh, and 
So that's the file I generated. It basically says, yo, the API server is at localhost 8080. Like, all right, let's use this. Kubelet, dash dash cube config, that file. So kubelet starts, uh, and now if I do a kubectl get all, I can see that the pod is creating. Uh, and if I wait a little bit more, whoops, this. Okay, now it's running, great. It has an IP address. I can even curl that IP address and I get the welcome to Nginx page. So we've built a cluster with one node and that cluster is now running a pod. So it's, it's nice. Okay. At that point, I, honestly, I was pretty proud of myself. So um, that, that's nice, but uh, the next step is that we want to connect to that pod using a service. Uh, so a service, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, um, it's really hard to give a good definition for a service. The best I could say, it's a, it's a static endpoint to connect to something, which sounds like super vague. Um, a service will typically have a cluster IP, which is an internal IP, a little bit like a service IP, you know, like it's, it's virtual. There is no container, there is no machine, there is nothing with that IP address. And when we connect to that IP address, uh, the connection is intercepted by magic, uh, but magic, I mean IP tables, and it will be uh, redirected to the, to the right place. Um, except at this point, we don't have anything in IP tables to take care of that. Okay, I have a bunch of rules, but uh, no, nothing like uh, intercepting that traffic. So uh, how do we create these IP tables rules? We use kube proxy. If, you, if you've been wondering like, oh, what's the point of kube proxy on my cluster? That's the job of kube proxy. Kube proxy is basically going to run commands like this. Uh, and it's using the output of these commands, it's going to generate a bunch of IP table rules. Of course, it's not shelling out to this command, it's talking to the API directly. Um, so when I want to start kube proxy, oh, uh, sorry, before, uh, the, the whole point of this uh, is to expose that deployment. Uh, and so after I've exposed it, uh, I want to be able to connect to that cluster IP here and I want this to work, except at this point it doesn't because I don't have these IP table rules I was uh, telling you about. Okay, so I start kube proxy. Again, kube proxy is going to tell me, hey, you need to tell me uh, where is the API server. I'm like, fine. So this is starting kube proxy. And now if I try to curl uh, the cluster IP, I get the welcome to Nginx. By the way, um, the non-Kubernetes related bit of knowledge that I find super great is that if you put an IP address like this, uh, it's going to automatically put zeros in the middle, which if you are lazy is awesome. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so now I have like this, uh, this, 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 what we call the pod to service network. So the thing that lets me connect to these cluster IPs. And yeah, if I want to look at my IP table rules now, uh, I should see somewhere um, a rule. Yeah, here I have a bunch of rules to intercept connections to these cluster IPs and rewrite the destination to be whatever. In that case, the, the IP addresses of my pods. Right. Um, so that's fine, but now uh, a cluster with only one node is a pretty boring thing, so I would like to try to add more nodes. And that's when things are going to get a little bit tricky. Like, okay, what happens um, if I just start kubelet on other machines? Like here I open a new terminal, I go to another node, uh, and I'm like, okay, and let's start kubelet. Well, first I need the kube config file uh, to tell kubelet where to connect. So I'm like, okay, let's transfer that config file using extremely secure protocols, aka the copy-paste on my X server. Uh, there we go. 
except this won't work because here I'm connecting to localhost and of course now I'm on a different node so localhost doesn't make sense so I need to change that localhost here here to put the IP address of the first node uh, the IP address of this node I think it's on interface ENS5 here right so that is this IP address like Okay, I put the IP address, I save, and then I do sudo, I think I need to start docker, and then sudo kubelet, uh, dash dash cube config with that configuration file. Okay, so it's doing a, a bunch of things. Um, I don't know if I need to worry about that, that might be fine. No, maybe not. Okay, right, of course, because um, my, my API server by default is only listening on localhost. So I need to restart that API server uh, so that it listens on other addresses. I think it's dash dash bind. Nope. Uh, so that's where I hit, okay. Uh, that might be dash dash address, okay. So I tell to my API server, all right, I know that I haven't set up, you know, certificates and all these things, but I still want you to listen on everything and not just localhost. And by the way, when we do that, the other components of the control plane, like uh, uh, the scheduler and the control manager, they bail out and I, I need to restart them. So if I had a real process manager, that would be fine. Uh, okay. And now if I go back, you see like it was like node two not found, but as soon as I fixed the API server, it was able to connect, uh, register itself. Proof is that uh, if I go back here and look at the list of nodes, now I have two nodes. Great. Uh, so I can, um, I can scale up a little bit. So what I'm going to do, uh, instead of Nginx, I'm going to use another deployment, uh, using image jptezo.htp.env. Uh, why? Because if you have a bunch of Nginx and you send a bunch of requests, they will all tell you welcome to Nginx and you don't know which one is serving the reply. So I've wrote this tiny little uh, HTTP server in Go and it serves its environment and in the environment variables, uh, we are going to get the, the host name. Uh, okay, so let's get three replicas and let's expose that deployment. Uh, and now if I curl that thing, so that's JSON and if I use JQ, uh, if you don't know JQ and you, and you have to use JSON, then look it up, it's awesome. So now if I send a bunch of requests, It's always the same backend uh, replying to me. So that's kind of weird. I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on here? Uh, well, if I have a look at the pods, I can see that I have, um, so I have uh, three pods for HTTP env. One is on node one. The other two are on node two. And if you've done a little bit of networking, you might also kind of uh, wince at this, the fact that I have pods with the same IP address. Obviously, that's not good. Uh, so how do we fix this and why, why is that even in the first place? Well, by default, when we, when we run kubelet, uh, it's not uh, dealing with the network. It's just starting containers using whatever container engine we use, and it lets the container engine, so Docker in that case, uh, figure it out. So when I have only one node, it works by sheer luck and coincidence, but if I have more than one node, now I need to make sure that I have unique IP addresses for my pods. So the first thing we can use uh, is a, a mechanism called kubenet. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we have two options, basically kubenet and CNI. Uh, kubenet sounds a lot like kubelet, which doesn't help. Um, so kubenet is a very simple implementation for the, for the networking where each node will have a subnet 
and kubenet is just going to pick an IP address in that subnet, uh, assign it to the pod, uh, and put the pod on a bridge. So then all we have to do is connect all these bridges together and assign a subnet to each node. Um, so I can restart uh, kubelet with the dash dash network plugin kubenet option. Um, and when I do that, it's going to complain. Uh, you can see like network plugin is not ready. Kubenet doesn't have a network config. Basically, I need to tell this node will have this subnet. Okay, so I can add dash dash pod cider, let's say 1099.10. Whoops, that was not the right option. Uh, okay, it's pod dash cider, so almost. Uh, right? Okay, then I need to do the same on the other node, like dash, uh, whoops, that was not that one, okay. On the other node, so I say use um, network plugin kubenet and podsider 1099.2.0. Like, all right, now we maybe we have a good networking. Uh, so I go back to my uh, control machine uh, and I look at my pods and then surprise, despair, whatever, I still have the same IP addresses. Yeah, because um, Kubelet is not going to touch the pods that are already running. Even if they are in a really weird state, uh, it's like these pods are running, um, I'm never ever gonna touch them because maybe that's your production customer Postgres database with very important stuff in it, which should probably not be in a cluster like this, but still. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to just like force um, Kubelet to fix this. And the easiest way is to just delete the pods and, uh, and let uh, them be recreated. So I do uh, what I call the, the pod apocalypse, which is kubectl delete pods. It's like, hey, which ones do you want to delete? All of them, I tell you, all of them. <laughs> so. uh, and then, yep, yeah, there we go. Um, so now my pods are running with uh, 1099 1, 1099.2, which is great. Uh, so I can even like ping them. Now, however, if I try to ping the pods on the other node, like, nope, that doesn't work. So like, hmm, why, why you no work? Well, first I need to set up routing uh, so that this node knows that this subnet is on the other node. Like, fine, let's, let's find out. Um, so I need to do IP route add and then the subnet of the pods on the other node, uh, and then the address of the other node, which is um, something, <clears throat> uh, let's say kubectl get nodes, right, that gives me the internal IP of the other node. So I add that route, oops, I need to uncomment that line, there we go, and it still doesn't work, and like, hmm, why not? Well, uh, because of IP tables. By default, we have like strict firewalling, so these random packets um, going over the network are not going to get through. Like, fine, I know IP tables, so I'm going to, don't do this at home, this is basically, <laughs> like, <laughs> allow all the packets, all of them. <laughs> And now it pings, yay. IP tables is an exact science, that's great. Um, so now, normally, uh, I should be able to use uh, kubectl get svc and then, yeah, send a bunch of uh, curl to that machine. Where was my nice little loop? Right, now I can see that the requests are served by a bunch of uh, different nodes. 
okay, that's progress, except there are many things where, where we're already kind of, you know, imagine we are, we're doing this and at the same time we're writing on the side all the things I need to automate if I want that to become usable for any kind of real purpose. And I'm like, all right, I need to allocate subnets to my uh, nodes, I need to set up routing, uh, I need to figure something about IP tables, and I hate IP tables. Um, so there are a bunch of things we need to do. So for some of these things, uh, we get some help uh, from Kubernetes. Uh, for instance, uh, the, instead of uh, setting up the, the CIDR myself, I can add an option to the controller manager to say, this is one big cluster CIDR, carve out subnets in there and assign them to the nodes. So that helps. Then I need to set up routing and I'm like, hmm, how am I going to do that? And so at, at that point, uh, it's, a, it's a good moment to introduce CNI, the, um, so the container network interface. Uh, the CNI is going to give us a bunch of things. First, instead of allocating inside of subnets, it can do arbitrary allocation. Uh, so that's convenient, for instance, if you're using uh, ENIs, Elastic Network Interfaces on uh, AWS. So you want to assign ENIs to your pods. And in that case, the IP addresses are just going to be the IP addresses of the ENIs. So you don't want to have just a subnet. You need to be able to pick a specific address. Uh, and sometimes you don't want to put your containers on a bridge. You, for instance, want to use a dedicated interface or something like MacVLAN or IPVLAN, etc., etc. That's where CNI comes in. Um, the principle of CNI is that you have CNI plugins. Uh, these plugins are just a, a bunch of programs. It could be like uh, binaries, scripts. Uh, they are in, whoops, in there by default. Uh, and they will be called by Kubelet whenever Kubelet needs to do something about the network, allocating an address, uh, configuring the network. Um, so uh, how do we use CNI? I'm going to try to run that demo, but I have less than 10 minutes left, so we will see what happens. Uh, I'm going to use a particular, um, uh, I was about to say CNI plugin, but no, it's, it's not a CNI plugin. It's going to be a particular solution for pod networking, but it doesn't come with its own CNI plugins. It's going to use uh, factory CNI plugins. It doesn't even need to, to, to provide its own CNI plugin. So the one I am going to show will be Cube Router. Uh, Cube Router uh, can do a bunch of things for us, and here, uh, what it's going to do, that's, yeah, that's the thing that is important. Uh, it's going to connect to the API server, it's going to obtain uh, the subnet of the node, uh, it's going to inject that subnet in a local file, uh, and then it's going to get the addresses of all the other nodes and establish what we call a BGP full mesh. Uh, BGP is the protocol that we use on the internet like to, to route between everything. So it's scalable, no doubt about it. Uh, and people who run Kubernetes on-prem sometimes like Kube Router or Calico because they both can uh, talk BGP. So when you have like real routers, uh, physical routers, or anything that speaks BGP that lets you exchange routing information between your Kubernetes cluster and the rest of the world. Uh, so let's try this. <clears throat> um, this is the, the difficult part. Um, so I need to here put network plugin equals CNI, I think. Oh, and uh, yeah, let's do that. Um, so at this point, it's complaining because it, it doesn't have a CNI configuration yet. And so what's going to happen uh, is that that CNI configuration will be uh, automatically added by a daemon set. So th this is how we typically run stuff on the entire cluster using a daemon set. A daemon set is a special construct in Kubernetes that creates one pod per node. So if you want to run the first thing that came to mind is Nagios. Why? Uh, if you want to run something on every node of the cluster, uh, you can set up a daemon set uh, to, to run that thing uh, on the whole cluster. So here I have a daemon set that's going to automatically run Kube Router on every node of the cluster. Uh, right, so I think this should do the trick, maybe, perhaps. 
Um, right. Uh, okay. So it doesn't work because this wants to run a privileged container. So a container that bypasses security, etc., because it will need to manipulate routing tables and stuff. Like, okay, so we need to uh, allow that. So I basically need to restart the API server uh, with something like, uh, is it dash dash privileged? No, allow, privile allow privileged, yep, that's it. Um, okay, after I do that, I can go back here. Now I can create that diamond set. And so now uh, I still don't have a cube router running on the cluster, so I might have forgotten something. Uh, but I think, I think since I just have like five minutes left, uh, I'm going to give my conclusions. So what's missing from this cluster? Uh, mostly security, like security is the one big thing that we completely shoved under the rug and then we put the elephant in the room on top of the rug so that nobody would notice, but um, that's really what we need here. And also availability. So security, we need to create uh, TLS certificates for everyone, for etcd, for the API server, for the other components of the control plane. We need to have individual TLS uh, certificates for the nodes so that each node has uh, its own identity to connect to the control plane. We also need to have the service account key pair uh, so service accounts uh, are kind of users like internally on, on, on Kubernetes um, and they typically uh, authenticate with uh, JSON web tokens and so these tokens will be generated by the controller manager signed with a specific key and then when, when you connect to the API server with that token, the API server can uh, verify like, uh, the, that it's a valid token using the other side of that key. Um, there are a couple of things that we need to think about, like we need to enable some admission controllers and some authorizers. Uh, so for instance, there are a couple of things to prevent a rogue node uh, from just like breaking everything. Um, so to, to say, okay, this node can only uh, update the information for itself and its own pods. Um, we can also set up bootstrap tokens if we want to be able to dynamically join nodes to the cluster. Another big thing is how do we cope with uh, outages of the API server? Uh, so on the, on the positive side, Kubernetes is designed so that everything just retries forever. So if the, Kube, if the API server goes away for a minute, for a week, for for a long time, uh, when it comes back, the kubelet will just pretend like nothing happened. Oh, you, oh you're back, cool, okay. Um, and it will uh, reconnect and resume operations. Um, so that's great, but we, we might still want to, to have availability, like improve the availability of the API server. So there are a couple of options, redundancy or reducing the time to repair. If, if, if the control plane goes down easily, but we can bring it back in a minute, then that's fine. Um, so if we replicate the control plane, the key uh, issue will be to think about how do we connect the control plane, then we need to add some kind of load balancer or so, some kind of uh, intermediary layer to connect to it. Now, repairing the control plane quickly, uh, that's also possible. Uh, for instance, if you are using a, a fancy hypervisor or something that lets you resurrect a VM if something bad happens because the VM is stored on a SAN or replicated somehow, then you don't need to have a, a control plane on multiple machines. You could have the control plane on one node, which is fairly easy to set up with kubedm. And then if that node has a problem, you just restart that VM somewhere else uh, and that works pretty well. Uh, that's all I got. Um, oh, one last word for my sponsor, aka myself. Uh, if you like this presentation, I can, well, first, uh, Wednesday we do the same thing, but in a lab environment. So the same demos, but you will have your own cluster to, uh, to experiment. And I can also deliver Docker and Kubernetes and that kind of training for your team. And finally, that's the QR code uh, leading to the slides. Uh, I think we're out of time for questions, but I will be just outside if you want to ask questions anyway. Thank you so much.